Welcome back to Mark Hulbert's vlog everyone. Thanks for joining in again today. Hey, have we uh, got a great video for you today. Guys, it's a special treat. I know a lot of you guys really appreciated the videos that I've been creating with the Jaguar F-Type here. The Jag now I've had a little over a year and I can really comment on a lot of the things that have gone wrong, some things that have gone off the rails, what I've known for fuel economy, what I've cost for maintenance and repairs. I've got some things to report and we're gonna summarize what a year's worth of ownership is for the F-Type and also why after this I can summarize too that everyone who likes performance cars should seriously give an F-Type a look. Bang for buck, there's no question, there's nothing on the market that is this good. Even for its $130,000 MSRP, there isn't really much to give this car a run for its money. So let's dive right into this guys, might as well just get right to it. First of all, I'm going to share some of the obvious things that I really love about this car. Number one is the pretty obvious styling. Now it's pretty easy just to say styling, yeah sure, overall it looks great, but there's some cues that very, very specifically do trigger me. For example, the swooping lines of these cars are absolutely beautiful. I just can't get enough of that look when I walk away. As I'm going into a store, I look back, I can't help but take another second and third and fourth look at the car. So it's just the voluptuous shape of the overall car. Another angle that's really amazing on these cars is the back third quarter. Right here, look at that angle, look at that haunch. It looks absolutely stunning and very, very menacing and mean at the same time. You know, look up here as well, You've just got that beautiful flow. Everything is very smooth and integrated. I mean, even the glass panels. Here's another thing I love is how this all just flows. You'll notice the roof, the windshield flows right through the roof, flows right to the back, and it all does so very smoothly and seamlessly. So another great thing that I love about these cars is what's underneath the hood. That's pretty obvious. Here, let's click that. Open that up. And let's pop the hood. And it's this supercharged 5 liter V8 engine that makes about 550 horsepower. And the SVR version makes 575. As well as the current base model R also makes now the SVR power from the outgoing model like this. So the current R makes 575. But they're all great engines. Even the V6s make decent enough power. So there's not really a want anywhere. The four cylinders are a little mild and meager. I would certainly step up to the V6, but anything with the V6 or V8 make phenomenal noises. So that takes me to the other thing that I love. I love the looks of that. How about another feature? When we do this, now it just gives it an overall cool look. That's a great car show party trick right there. Crack all the windows and doors and everything and you'll have a car that just looks ready for a car show. Absolutely beautiful. Now the thing that isn't particularly great with this hood, I've spoke about this in the past, is the way it closes. And when it closes, sometimes the panels don't always align. So another great thing is all of the little accents that make this car feel a little bit more special than even some of the other Jaguars. For example, you have a Jaguar logo right there. How about an R decal right there? And it says Jaguar on the headlights, as well as Jaguar again. And how about right there on the door handle itself? And as well, you'll see it on the glass. Now let's pop, and you'll see Jaguar on the vents right there. Of course you see Jag there and the little R emblem. How about the embossment on the headrest? As well, you've got the Jaguar symbol right in there. And the R on the display, as well as on the center display there as well. You want more? And how about another one yet right there? Oh wait, there's more Jaguar logos right there, as well as the R again, lets you know it's serious. So at the end of the day, there's a whole lot of different elements that remind you you're in something cool. As well as the interior is just overall a very nice place to be, but we'll talk about that in a second. Look at the exterior, we have more features. I gotta love the red calipers on the carbon fiber wheels. This is a beautiful wheel. However, it's not very friendly if you've got rocks in the area. Be careful because these are very, very expensive and they can cost you a lot if you curb them once. So after a year's worth of ownership, there's another thing that this car does for you and it just never gets old. Here, check it out. Let's fire this car up. So the sound of that exhaust just never gets old, but it gets better. 
Cold starts are very loud on this as well as you can toggle the exhaust button that gives you loud exhaust sounds once you hit 3000 RPM. But if you put it in dynamic mode, it gets you the full beans and it just never gets old. It also gives you the red display. It's just a very, very cool thing. It's full of toys that just keep you engaged. So after a year's time, there's nothing that's worn out in the interior and nothing really gets old. I mean, I can show you around here. A few people comment that when you get miles on your car, this starts to wear out or these buttons start to look a little tattered. Mine at about 50, now I'm at 56,000 kilometers and everything still looks as new pretty much. These buttons still look good. The brushed aluminum still looks nice and healthy. Everything still looks really good. All the leather and whatnot all the way around, including the steering wheel still looks and feels the part. It's just amazing. This is the only part that I find a little kind of junky. When you hit that, you'll notice you can kind of see you know, the, the glare of the light kind of makes it hard to see that. But if you get it at the right angle, you can look at that and then you hit that and then you can give it your heated seats or you can turn that off. That becomes a little hard to see with light. As you can see, you get a little shine and reflection and you can't see that. So those, and as they wear, this gets more scratchy, scratchy, becomes even more difficult to see. That's the only part that I would say doesn't really work for me in this interior. The interior is really high quality and it's holding up very, very well. The piano gloss black, I would not touch it with anything other than a lint-free microfiber towel because this does scratch and I've seen in a few cars I came across actually a C-Class Mercedes Benz when we were shopping for my wife's car right there which is the C300 we also came across a convertible had decent miles on it but that black plastic was all scratched all the junk and it just it does a number for the interior it really does take away from the look so that's all holding up very well I would say overall this car holds up very well there's there's very little to report in terms of wear and tear other than the windshield, as you can see, I've got a crack and that split. And of course, there it ends there. I had to get that drilled out and it's cracked along this side as well. Problem with that is we're talking about a two or $3,000 windshield, so I didn't bother with that. But other than that, the car is wearing very well. What other cool little party tricks this thing has? Of course, you've got this and you can follow that and you see that it's a great opening. And these cool little guys here. These are what you'd consider, I guess, they're supposed to be a sun visor, but they are very, very small. It's only probably about three inches in height, so it's pretty small, but it does the trick because this is a low windshield line here, so it, you don't need a whole lot to stop the sun from blasting you in the eyes. So that's cool. I think that's a cool little party trick. Cool to show your friends, they get a chuckle out of that. Paddle shifters, they're great. And of course, as I mentioned before, you can either toggle exhaust button right here or pull full dynamic. And if I put it in dynamic mode, then you get the red displays and it looks great. Now you can hear it. Here, let's roll it down a bit. Ooh. Ooh. Oh yeah. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Oh yeah. Other than the fact this car makes such phenomenal noises, it's sex on wheels for the looks of it, and it can crack off a zero to 60 in three and a half seconds. What's not to like about that? Have you seen videos? I've seen videos where they put one of these up against a McLaren 720, and of course, by the end of the quarter, the 720 has lapped this car. But out of the hole on the eighth mile, this car actually comes out of the hole even quicker than a McLaren 720, if you can believe it, because of the all wheel drive. It just hooks and goes. So the performance is second to none. Sure, maybe you can get a, a BMW M5 competition will slightly out accelerate this or an M8 competition. Those cars are supremely fast as well. But again, this package is the whole thing with the sounds and the looks to boot. It's not just about the performance. But enough about all the good stuff. We know about all the good stuff. There's a million reviews about that. You guys want to hear some of the things that have gone sideways for me. Well, let's start with that. For example, well, I had a couple glitches. Right here we have the in control app here for Jaguar right there. You can see my car, I've got him called Gooch. Yeah, that's the nickname, but usually it works without flaw. You type it in, you can do a remote start, you can set your climate control and do a bunch of other stuff. There's also, you can monitor its location, so if it gets stolen or you wanna track your history, where you've been, it's a great app. It does a lot of great features. But I've had a couple times where after I start it, then I get in the car then what you do is you press the brake and then the car comes alive. 
Well, normally everything's supposed to come alive. Your stereo, your gauges, and all of your heating controls. But it happened to me twice now where it didn't come alive. The lights didn't come on. Like basically the running lights, but the full lights didn't come on. I didn't have my gauge cluster. I didn't have anything. The car was running, but some of the other things weren't. So there was a bit of a hiccup there. That was one problem. Another problem is right there. Now, I don't know why, there's a seal in there somewhere. Actually, when I wash the car, sometimes what I find is water starts to drip in right there around that speaker. And I get water kind of pouring, puddling down, and it makes its way. So I get water on the inside of the car dripping all over the place. Now it's not pouring in by any means. It's not flooding the car out. It's never gotten to a point where it's leaving a puddle on the floor. However, it does sort of, there's always a few drops coming in on that speaker. And I found that to be a problem for me. And I think Jaguar, you guys got to know there's probably a seal related issue there. And I might have that looked after. Another problem is down here. This has been in the shop twice now. So as I press that, listen. That's been a problem for a few times. I've actually had the car in three times now where the pedal bushings, I believe, are a little bit squeaky. So when you press the pedal, there's a bit of ee -ee -ee squeak in there. And I'm not a lover of that. Now, of course, it's functioning. The brakes are fine, but you get that squeak in there on a $130,000 car. I don't want to hear a squeak in the brake pedal. Not the brakes themselves, but the actual pedal is where you were getting the squeak. So that was another annoyance for me. Now there's been also another recent thing that's crept into this whole situation. And I don't know why, not that I love it. And anybody who's been watching me for a while know that I do not like this feature on any car. And that is the auto shutoff. So start, stop, control right there. When the light's on, that basically means it's activated and ready to work. So as you pull up to a set of lights, the car, once it's warmed up and you've driven X amount of kilometers, the car will automatically shut off until you take your foot off the brake then the car automatically fires up again, and then you can set off. Well, guess what? In the last, I don't know, I haven't even noticed when it stopped working, but it doesn't even work anymore. I have not, I've been watching for it in the last month. Every drive I've been on, the car's fully warmed up. As you can see like that, the gauge is midway, so there's no issue about it being warmed up. And I will also have gone many kilometers, 20, 30, 40 kilometers, and then I'll pull up to a set of lights and that just isn't working anymore for me. I've tried a few things. I've tried to intentionally activate it. I've even tried to shut that light off and tried a few things back and forth. It's not working for me anymore. I don't know why. Maybe it happened during an uh, software update. Maybe something glitched and then it just sort of jammed the computer. I don't know, but it's not working. So that's another notable. Another thing I want to show you on the outside of the car. And this has been a problem for some time. And this is a problem every time you drive in the winter time. And it's this seal right here. Now there's been lots of talk on the forums about this scratching because it catches rocks and gravel in there and it scratches the glass. Well, mine has also done that. I can actually feel it right there. There's a scratch, there's, it's carved right into the glass. But more important than that is what I'm finding in the winter time now, this freezes up on the outside or the inside and then this window will not drop when I open it. If it's 30 below, and maybe, you know, you got a little snow in there and it melted while you're driving and then it freezes again at night. When you go to open your door, this should drop down a half inch. But right now it's fine. See, it goes back up. But lots of the time, when you're around that freezing temperatures, I find once you get water in here, whether it's snow or water or ice, it freezes up and that doesn't drop down. And then it, you kind of almost have to force the door open, which doesn't feel right because you got to think at some point you might break something and that's not a beautiful thing. So that's something to note if you plan on driving these things in the winter time, either A, take a special precaution for this, maybe clean that out thoroughly every time you drive it, or B, maybe there's a special cover that you can drape over that or drape over the cabin during the winter time season so you can peel it away and then you have no moisture in there because that is a problem and I've experienced it many, many times. And then there's another thing, and it's not really a fault of the car, but it is the car's design that sort of allows it to happen. And that is, it's very susceptible to road rash. I mean, these fat meats, you've got these Pirelli P0s, which are terrible in winter to start with. So if you're gonna drive these cars in the winter time, be sure to swap them out with some winter skins. But also they do a real number in throwing rocks against your rockers right there. And then they throw the rocks all the way along 
as well as you get a real splattering in here. Now fortunately, I put the Expel film here, so it might be a matter of just replacing the film every couple of years, but that's what's happened is the bodywork has a real susceptance to, susceptibility to taking a real beating from stones as well. Back here, I'm starting to see a slight little mark right here. Even though I've got this guard, there's also some marks. So this tires still kick up just enough and just clear that. And there's already a strip of what you can see a little bit of light road rash. It's not worn right down to the plastic, but it can happen. And I'm starting to see slight, a little bit of deterioration there. As well as you can also see the general build quality is in some places a little bit short and I'm starting to see this like you get plastic that moves around here pretty good you see some gaps that maybe shouldn't exist right there all right let's go for a bit of a drive and I'll explain some of the costs and even the fuel economy I've experienced with the Jag here okay I want to mention so costs of repairs and maintenance well first of all you know what I think Tata Motors has done some great things and from my experience in a year's worth of ownership I haven't seen a ton that would indicate that there's any significant issues some of the problems with the windows and some of those things are more indicative to low production number type cars as well as the build quality in general with the plastic fenders and so on but generally speaking I would say what I'm finding is pretty good durability with the most of the majority of the car now with that said, I had to spend about a thousand bucks, if you want to know, for costs and servicing for this car. It's cost me about a thousand dollars this year so far, and what that essentially was, was an oil service. I also did a brake fluid flush, as well as the front transfer case fluid change. So there's been a little bit of maintenance around there. They also did a software update, which you saw in one of my previous videos. That one was a problem. The SIM card wouldn't take the read, and there was an issue, and my car actually had to sit at the shop for a week now for me that's where I'd say this car possibly could be a bit challenging as a daily driver now with that said Jaguar has been great they've always lent me a loaner car so even if your car is out of commission for a week or two weeks maybe even a month they're lending you a loaner car at least locally here they are and I've never felt like I've had had been compromised and I've always felt like I've been well supported by Jaguar locally here so to me that's not as big an issue even though you might find getting parts or getting servicing for a limited type of car as, as an F type here isn't really so much a problem I, I found it not to be a real big issue like I said all they did was plant me in uh, an F pace for a week straight I also had an XE model so I've always had something to drive around in compliments for free by Jaguar so I have no issues no complaints there but the SIM card and some of those issues and getting it done within a week, to me, sound more indicative to, you know, the low production number thing. Now, a SIM card's pretty standard, I would have thought. You'd think something like that would be standard on a shelf, but apparently I still had to wait a week because they tried uploading to it a few times. It wouldn't take. Then they had to order one in. And again, it took about a week from the time a car went in to the time I received it back. So I got to believe that some of the challenges you might find with these cars are that once they go into the shop, they might sit there for a week or more. Now, another thing, and as I mentioned, this is a five liter V8 engine. And a lot of you guys are probably wondering, well, you know, you're not buying this for fuel economy. This is a performance car, and actually a high performance car. Supercharged 5 liter V8, 550 horse plus, mild tune and a pulley, and you're well over 600 beans. So why are you possibly worried about fuel economy? Well, I'm not, for the most part. Uh, it doesn't really phase me, but I know people do wonder, just out of curiosity. Interestingly enough, even my Lamborghini, there's been people ask, what kind of fuel economy do you get with that car? Or how much is your, your insurance on that car? Well, for the most part, that's irrelevant. You drive these cars for what they bring and the passion that they, they motivate you and, and they excite you in the drive. So who really cares? But I will share that with you. Today, I'll give you an example. I just filled up the tank. It went about 450 kilometers on about 50 liters of fuel. So when you back calculate that, it works out to about 11 liters per 100 kilometers or about 21 miles per gallon. Now, most of that is kind of freeway. A lot of the driving I do is sort of a mix of freeway and side streets, but mostly freeway. But I'll tell you this much, I'm also on the throttle on and off at a you know regular occurrence. So 
it's not that I'm constantly idling around. I'm not. I get on it and I enjoy it when the time is right. So I would say that's a pretty good indication. So this car, the fact that it makes over 20 miles to the gallon, to me is not a bad situation at all. Oh, I gotta love the sound, guys. Check it out. So let's hit it, guys. So the other thing I've got to add, I've had people ask me the question, would you rather take this over the Lamborghini Gallardo? And initially my thought was, well, no, you couldn't replace a Lamborghini. But then the more I got to think about it and the more I've owned this car, the more I like getting behind the wheel of it and leaving the Lamborghini in the garage. As a matter of fact, this is like that hot girl next door when the Lamborghini is like that supermodel. Do you always want that finicky supermodel attitude and the high cost of maintenance with that? Well. I guess that's your own kind of debate, but at the end of the day, this car is so easy to live with. It's fast, that eight speed ZF automatic transmission makes it so easy to drive. The Lamborghini, it's very difficult with the E-gear. It's very kind of choppy and lurchy, whereas this is just get in and go. It shifts hard, it shifts fast. It almost feels like a double clutch, but just smoother. And when I first drove one of these, this is the other thing I have to comment on. This is where I think People who have been considering buying one of these F-Types, don't wait too long if you've been considering one because obviously there's not many left. Now with back orders up and of course demand is up, well supply is going down and sadly enough after a few years we may not have an internal combustion Jaguar left. This might be the end of a dying breed. And the thing I have to mention, of course it's a low production number car. If you curb the car, it's going to cost you big bucks for rims. If you dent the fender or dent the hood, it's going to cost you big bucks because the car is primarily aluminum and you can't really fix it like you do a conventional steel car. Replacing panels will get very, very expensive as well. So be sure to check that a car you're buying hasn't already been wrecked because they are very expensive. Parts are also very hard to come by. And if it's going to be your only vehicle, be sure to check with your local dealer that they will support you in the sense of giving you a loaner or you have some other means to get to work or get around if the car's in the shop because you may find these cars in the shop a little longer than your average garden variety Toyota or even Lexus. The other thing I've got to finish this off with guys, I've heard lots of YouTubers, people talk about the value. Sure, you can get one of these for 40 grand, 50 grand, 60 grand US. Sure, when they're 130, new it seems like a phenomenal value and it is I agree with them entirely but I would go a step further this is actually a great value at hundred and thirty thousand MSRP as a matter of fact when I first drove one of these I drove it right back back to back, to back with a brand new Porsche 911 Carrera 4S that had the 991 generation and PDK transmission that car was so good and yet I drove one of these the week after and I knew right away I wanted the F type so it is still amazing value at hundred and 30 grand it provides you all the thrills and then some above and above and beyond most other cars in its class these cars are immaculate they're amazing and they're stunning just be aware that they aren't necessarily cheap to maintain and of course you're going to have to wait for some of the repairs and maintenance hope you guys all enjoyed it and please be sure to drop a line I'd love to hear from each and every one of you guys what do you think F type good car Buy it now, buy it later. I don't think you'll find too many around later on. These may, in fact, go up in value. As a matter of fact, within this last year, prices have started to creep back up. This is an 18. I've seen the prices continually drop. They've stabilized, and now I'm starting to see other 18s in the area for more than I paid a year later. It's really, really odd. But be sure to drop a line. Hope to see you guys next time. Catch you then. Bye-bye.